Chief Justice is another very distinguished occupant of the post who served as Chief Justice for just 74 days last year, but whose tenure is marked by truly some remarkable achievements. Most notably, the manner in which more than 16,000 cases were listed and almost 4,000 of them were cleared within the first 12 days of his tenure as CJI. And constitution benches were set up to dispose of key pending cases of constitutional importance. Please welcome Justice Yu Yu Lalit. <laughs> Firstly, Justice Lalit, the manner in which you attempted to clear that judicial pile, that pile up in the apex court, was that a mission that you set yourself when you became Chief Justice? You knew you were Chief Justice for less than three months, but quite remarkably from day one, you really cracked the whip. It was not a mission, but it was something like a concerted action on part of everyone who was on the bench. The day I took over, same day we had a full court meeting, and I placed before the, all the judges the statistics that there are about, say, 55 death sentence matters which are pending, and under the regime that the Supreme Court has accepted, a death sentence matter has to come before a bench of three judges, which means that one must have sufficient number of three judge bench combinations. If you have just one or two combinations, the judges get sort of, you know, it starts weighing on their conscience that how many death sentence matter am I supposed to hear? So I said we must have at least six three judge combinations so that we can divide the work amongst the benches. We were to start with, we were 30 judges. So I also told the, all my colleague judges that divide 30 number by five and we can possibly have six constitution benches. All of us will be part of the benches. So what I did was six three judge combinations, which means 18, six two judge combinations, which means 12. Every time, you know, just add A on one side and B on the other and you have a constitution bench. So this is how we started. Then the second part which I told the judges was that there were referred matters to three judges combination which were pending consideration. What happens is on a question of law, if a matter is referred to a bench of three judges, there is a domino effect that there are a number of other matters which are waiting for the decision in that matter. So therefore, if you decide one matter, logically you are actually deciding host of the other matters. So therefore, it is in this situation that we devised a way, and that's how we started. And I must thank every colleague of mine that everyone rose to the occasion, and we started disposing of matters. The but it's, is, it's had a huge effect. I can tell you that a lot of lawyers have truly appreciated it. Those who cover the courts have appreciated what you did. But you know, I'll give you an example. Number of cases that were pending for a long time, the Siddiq Kapan case. A journalist is arrested under UAPA in 2020, October. The bench headed by you grants him bail in August 2022. And this comes at a time when a number of lower courts in this country are reversing the basic principle of law, bail, not jail. They're instead saying, you know, not granting bail. You can go to Shah Rukh Khan's son's case in a lower court or a number of other le uh, less high profile cases. Is that a worry for you that, you know, as someone who's an expert on criminal law, that a number of judges, especially in the lower courts, are not granting bail in cases where bail should have been given as a as, as in the normal courts? See, it depends upon the perspective of an individual. Some of the trial court judges, perhaps, they think that the case is not made out for grant of bail. Add to it one more dimension. Many of these statutory provisions make it difficult to grant bail. So therefore, there is an embargo under the statutory provision, say for instance, NDPS law, the bail is, cannot be granted so easily. So therefore, a satisfaction first has to be entertained, has to be recorded by the judge that very well, you know, in my view, the man is not guilty of the offense with which he is charged. And then only the process of bail consideration then happens. So most of these occasions where the trial court or the judges in the first court do not grant bail, Maybe because, number one, that the matter is still sort of, you know, pending investigation. So therefore, 
On most of the occasions, the investigating machinery comes up before the court and says that we are still in the process of investigating. So therefore, the court has to make up mind whether on the basis of material cases made out or not, or should I wait for some more material? It may be that way. But, but do you think there needs to be a review of the process, that the Supreme Court needs to send out, perhaps the Chief Justice Office needs to send out perhaps a clearer message? Look at the way PMLA, sir, the Prevention of Money Laundering Act has now, you know, and, and it's based now on a Supreme Court judgment, virtually giving police powers of a kind to the enforcement directorate that are draconian. Because it essentially means you are guilty and you will have to prove innocence. Enforcement directorate can come into my house under PMLA, arrest me, and I will struggle to get bail for months on end, even if I may be innocent. You are right. It may happen in an individual case. But if you see the, the judgment of the Supreme Court, which was rendered by a bench of three judges, of course, the review is pending on that issue. But this very point was urged before the court, and the court did not consider it appropriate to rule on that to say, and actually said that PMLA definitely hinges on one part, which is that the bail provisions, as I mentioned in the earlier, earlier just about five minutes back, some of these statutory provisions make it difficult to grant bail, and PMLA is one of them. Should they be reviewed? Then the validity of the legislation has to be challenged, number one. Number two, it is a parliamentary legislation. So therefore, it is our legislators who have come out with this particular law. Unless and until that legislation is validly challenged before the court, the court is bound to proceed on the basis of that. This is, let, let me come to where, in a way, string our, uh, the thread that I began with Justice Bobde. How independent are our courts? Has the apex court in this country turned into what scholars like Gautam Bhatia have suggested, an executive court? mindful of being in line with whatever the political executive really wants. Basically, for all the obiter dicta that often we hear from judges, all the fire and brimstone against the government, when it comes to the judgments, they fall in line with what the political executive wants. This is what a legal scholars suggest is the making of an executive court. I do not subscribe to that view at all. According to me, all the courts, are quite independent, and you will actually see it in the process. Say, for instance, two matters which came before me, one was Siddiq Kappan, the other was Tista Settlewad. Both of them were released on bail. Another matter which came before me, Vinod Dua, he was also granted solace relief in the matter. Third one, again, somebody from Varavara Rao, again, we granted him relief. It's not as if. Please, and what happens is we, we, are, we jump in immediately to make a generalized statement. It is not so. The courts are completely independent, and this kind of theory which Justice Bobde actually referred to, that it is very, very difficult for the judges and very easy for somebody from outside to criticize that. You know, as media persons, we can... Of course, uh, it, yes. it, it, you are it's, entitled to. It, yes. It's our job to, in a way, yes. question. You say criticize, but the sealed envelope. You know, important cases, the judges say, please give it to us in a sealed envelope. We don't know what's in the sealed envelope. Uh, no, and I'll, that results I'll, in a lack of transparency. I'll tell you, this all started in that Vineet Narayan case, That's which right. was Jain Diary case, correct? Now, at that juncture, the Supreme Court was interfering or was considering the matter and... At that juncture, the investigation was still on. It was not clear whether the material which the investigator had collected, was it worthy, was it sufficient? But at the same time, the court just wanted to consider that the issue was considered or looked into by the investigators. So therefore, sealed envelope was entertained. The court did not pass any order. All that it said is that if according to you, Mr. Investigator, there is a case made out, proceed further. That's it. You know, it's interesting you mentioned just now, a little while ago, the Tista Settlement case. Because I recall, sir, and let me be honest today, when you became Chief Justice, uh, there was media comment again that Justice Lalit, I think when you became a judge, actually, that you had been Amit Shah's counsel in the Sorabuddin case, and that will Justice Lalit therefore be truly independent? You showed through your judgments that you were independent, and kudos to you for that. But there was this sense that, will, did that ever weigh on your mind that will 
the media commentary that plays out that here is the Home Minister's former counsel in the Sorabuddin case, now the Chief Justice. Am I, were you under extra pressure at any stage? Not at all. See, as a lawyer, I represented something like 18 Chief Ministers in various matters, including SM Krishna, who was from Congress, Sukram, who was from Congress, some of the three Chief Ministers from Maharashtra who were from Congress, Yadiyurappa, who was BJP, <laughs> Then Jailalita, who was again in the opposition. So I have represented number of them. I have not met any one of them. So therefore, it was only pure and simple professional assignment. To me, it was like appearing in any matter, whether it was ABC, XYZ, or that politician. It makes no difference. That's wonderful to hear, sir, because I think it's important to recognize, perhaps, that sometimes the media criticism, as you said, uh, is based around speculation. But let's come for a moment to judicial pressure. During your term, the one case where you found yourself in a bit of a spot, you listed a case on a Saturday on an appeal filed by the Maharashtra government challenging the acquittal of a DU professor, GN Sai Baba, accused of Maoist links. Many, of, many saw this as unusual, especially as Justice Chandrachud on the Friday had orally expressed a view against any urgent listing. Next morning, listing takes place, a bench sits, and the acquittal is suspended. And many believe that this was done under pressure. I've already responded to this line of question in one of the interviews. And that was by, perhaps I think, uh, Srinivas and Jain. That's right, after Correct? you uh, yes, demitted office. Right. I'll tell you, in case now that you have repeated the question, then I must answer it completely. See, it was a Friday, and that was the last working day for Justice Hemant Gupta. So it was, he was demitting office, and on the last day, the custom is that the retiring judge sits in with the Chief Justice. So he was sitting with me. And the last day, the number of matters which are listed before such a bench are very, very less. So we rose for the day around 1 o'clock. The matter was mentioned in court number 2 because the Chief's court was not sitting. So it was mentioned before the bench presided over by Justice Chandrachud. Justice Chandrachud, naturally, because when you are mentioning, the papers are not before you. So the matter was mentioned by the learned solicitor general. And his first reaction was that in case the bail is the issue, then why should we list it tomorrow? Correct. But finally, the solicitor general perhaps was able to convince him so therefore, the order which was passed had three paragraphs. Number one, saying that the apprehension is expressed by Mr. Solicitor General that in case the matter is not heard immediately, the person may be released on, released immediately. Yes. Number two, we therefore allow him to make a mention before the, so, so that to get the matter listed next day. Now, it was possible for the court to list the matter next week because the normal mentioning was there. But the court was definitely convinced that if we list the matter sometime next week, that is Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, perhaps the urgency which has been canvassed will completely get nullified. And therefore, the chance had to be given that in case the matter can be listed on Saturday. Now, the other thing is, such kind of urgent listings, the court number two is not entitled to do. Going by the master of roster, it is only the chief who can do it. So therefore, the order was actually put in a very, very, what we say is the, is the format of deference, that we give liberty so and so, so and so, to make a mention. But the intent of the order is that definitely you consider the matter, so therefore, at about, say, 4 o'clock when the matter was brought before me, the order, the paper book again was not before me. Secondly, the man who brings before me the order was not aware as to what oral observations were made by the court while the mentioning was on. So I was to go to the, to the, to the hall where the final felicitation of Justice Gupta was to be undertaken. So as we enter, the first person that I wish to contact is Justice Chandrachod himself. I approach him and say that now that you have actually come out with this order, will you be part of the special bench to be constituted tomorrow? 
he had certain reservations because he had given some kind of you know commitments to somebody so therefore he said it won't be possible the major part of the day i have given some commitments so therefore i turned to the next because it was right there all the judges were there so three judges justice rastogi justice gavai and justice surakant i approached them they again say that we have some other commitments the fourth judge that i approach is justice ravindra bhat he said sir i have actually called the steno to complete a judgment so therefore i have some commitment on that front but in case you don't get anybody i am willing so as a default option so the next person that i contact is justice bela trivedi she says yes then the man next who i bump into is justice mr shah i again put the same question to him he said yes so this is how the bench got constituted okay i'm glad now, you gave no 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 just listen to that none of those persons neither mr shah nor bela trivedi nor me are aware of the intricacies of the matter the intricacies of the matter are actually before the bench which had heard the mentioning none of us were even aware of that we simply listed the matter next day why in deference to what the order had said okay it's interesting that you've given that back story to clear the air again it's part as i said therefore the media will have their own commentary which carries on and i will come that to the media pressures on a on a judge but very quickly sir collegium system do you approve of what the law minister has been saying publicly calling for a review of the system do you believe that the executive deserves a greater say or some would even say a, a return to the njac Uh, the national judicial appointments committee do we need a return to that see as judges we take oath that we will abide by the constitution as by law established wasn't it the judgment of the five judges which said that njsc is not the correct law so are we supposed to observe and go by the constitution as by law established or have a different modality we had to observe purely by the collegium system see in a polity if you have another system if you have another regime in contemplation let that regime be put in place in a manner known to law the moment it is put in place the judges will be bound to observe that as of now if you ask me my personal view then according to me the collegium system is the ideal system is the ideal system absolutely you don't believe it leads to aberrations it leads to sort of lack See, of o- every- there is an opacity to it there is a a sense that the judiciary becomes a bit of a cabal that decides on its own who will be the fellow judges see i'll tell you now this collegium which was headed by justice ramana where i was judge number 2 in the court we had justice kanvilkar as number 3 and three of us we made recommendations which were accepted by the government and about 255 persons were appointed at the same time we did not accept the matters which were coming through the collegium of the high court and about 70 or 80 names we rejected 40 odd names are still under consideration by the government so therefore look at the kind of uh, you know the statistics themselves show that we at the apex level we don't accept everything which comes through the collegium of the high court now how is the matter actually coming through the collegium see you require judges at every level the whole system is geared to have the best possible talent now under the constitution the lower judiciary or the district judiciary is completely under the control of the high court appointments posting promotion transfers everything is done by the high court the executive has no say it is through these courts that one third of the strength of the high court is actually forming so you have those persons who's entire profile is seen by the high court at every juncture not just one or two persons but repeatedly as an institution similarly the advocates who practice before the high court they the judges who form the body they see their performance every day so who are actually supposed to be better position to see the merit or the talent somebody sitting as an executive here or somebody who is actually seeing the grassroot level performance say in kochi or in manipur or in andhra or in say ahmedabad now let, let me quote alone so so let me quote again dushyant dave uh, a senior supreme court advocate we have a large number of judges who are highly questionable 
they either lack the expertise or the knowledge and most of all the commitment. I know of judges who haven't delivered a single good judgment. I don't know about Mr. Dushan Dave's sort of, you know, this particular statement and why he made that statement. But it is for him to justify that. I can't actually have a counter justification, correct? According to me, see, that is exactly why. When a man is made judge of the high court, you see the performance. When we select a man, Justice Bobde, anybody who has been part of the collegium, we see the judgments, we see the kind of performance which he has over a period of time has actually come out with. It is after that, that five judges of the Supreme Court then consider whether a man is worthy or not. At the same time, they are also guided by the advice given by what we call the consulting judges. So in the process, there are not just five who are collegium judges, but there are other consulting judges as well. At the same time, the version coming from the executive, the executive, as Justice Bobde said, that perhaps it may have something to say about the profile of the man. It may be that there may be some kind of complaint against him. There may be something, some dark corner somewhere in the persona, which perhaps as, as judge in the college, we are not aware of. So therefore, that part of the consultation through IB reports to everything is also placed before the court. It is after that that the process, that the decision is taken. Okay, you know, because there are interesting cases like that of Justice, uh, of, of Senior Advocate Saurabh Kirpal, which has been held up and, and it's, you know, result is, is his sexual orientation the reason for it? All of this is speculated. See, again, now just consider this. The Collegium did not falter on Saurabh Kirpal's case. Collegium did make a recommendation. Collegium did reiterate. So how do we say Collegium system is bad? It is the fault lies somewhere else, if at all. Okay. I want to ask you this uh, in conclusion. Uh, you quite wonderfully, after you've retired, have gracefully gone to teach OP Jindal University, Mumbai IIT, your teaching constitutional law. Honest answer. Should former CJIs or judges after retirement take any government sinecure without a cooling off period? We've just had a Supreme Court fellow colleague of yours becoming a governor of a state. We've had a Supreme Court chief justice becoming a nominated member of the Rajya Sabha. Do you believe this is a healthy practice? It all depends upon the individual. See, some individuals may, may find nothing objectionable. Person like me would rather say that very well, let me try something else in another quarter. Correct. I have been a lawyer, I have been a judge. Let me be a professor now. Yes. You know, I think those cheers really say it all, that there is a problem if you don't have a cooling off period. So very quickly, your most difficult case. Not in terms of any quality or any kind of problem which it posed, but sheer bulk of the matter, that was 2G. The kind of, you know, paperwork which ran into lakhs and lakhs of pages, to be controlling that, to be sort of, you know, in the midst of everything where there were at least, by the time we finished, more than 150 witnesses were examined. So much of documentation. So sheer bulk, that was the only thing. You know, what's the most satisfying thing about being a judge? You were a very successful lawyer. What, what was uh, most satisfying of being a judge? You must have taken a huge cut in salary to become a judge. The, all that is something completely a personal decision, correct? Yes. See, I, I always felt that I have been part of this institution uh, before I took that plunge. I had put in about 32 years in the practice as a lawyer. I have earned some name, some fame, some money, some stature. It is only through that profession which is the law profession. So there is some way to give back to the society and that is where I accepted judgeship. Another feature or another form in which I wish to give it back to the society is teach the law students, that's it. Three words, three words to describe the, three words to describe the state of the Supreme Court today. Fantastic court, yet tremendous area for improvement. Okay, I think you've left enough, you've given us a teaser perhaps yes. for another interview where we'll discuss 
perhaps those areas of improvement. But Justice Lalit, uh, it's been a pleasure having you here today. It, the pleasure has been mine. Sir. And uh, speaking so openly and freely, I think moment people demit office, some of that burden goes away and you can speak even more freely. And I'm sure that's as true of you as many others. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Justice. Thank you, you, you. Lalit.